First, I have to close the microphone. Uh, close the microphone. Uh, no, not necessarily. I'll call the special meeting of the executive, executive and legislative committee for Thursday, March 29th to order. Are we in compliance with the open meeting law? Yes. If you have an agenda before you uh, and has not been amended, I'd entertain a motion to adopt the agenda. So moved. moved by Wenzel, seconded by Fordham. Turn the microphone on. Turn the mic on. Turn the mic on. Not, Don't ask me. <laughs> it's not supposed to, I, but this one is not supposed to come over the, oh. the house uh, system here. The ones that are hooked up to the guys that actually say something and mean something, you'll hear those guys coming over the system. But um, any other comments or questions on the agenda? If not, you've heard the motion, the second to adopt the agenda as published for tonight's meeting. All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Do we have any public comment before we get to the meat of the program? Any public comment? If not, um, at this time I would uh, like to, first of all, uh, before we go through participant uh, introductions, uh, certainly thank uh, Craig Culver for allowing us to not only use this uh, beautiful new facility tonight and, and play host to uh, this gathering countywide, and we do have a representation countywide, but uh, thank him for it. But uh, I'm, I ask Craig just to uh, welcome uh, you folks also to uh, you know, to this area. So go ahead, Craig. Welcome to Sockburg. And also, welcome to Delicious. <laughs> I'd like to thank Judy and Connie uh, also tonight. They stayed later tonight. And, uh, and this guy right here, George Kelsey, as well, uh, for, for ho helping host and uh, taking you around in the building. Our pleasure. Uh, thank you, Judy. Thank you, Connie. Uh, thank you very much, as a matter of fact. Uh, We've been in the building, uh, this will be three years in uh, Thanksgiving, right? Yeah. Three years, and uh, we love the building. Uh, we've got room to go over here in the building as well. As a matter of fact, we can add on that way, we can actually add on that way. We're just going to push the Schwartz building out of the way when we <laughs> over that way. But uh, I, I appreciate you uh, coming down as well, and uh, it's kind of fun to show off, of course, our little community and, uh, and our building as well. So. Enjoy your meeting. Uh, Marty, actually, I'm not going to stay. I'm, uh, I'm going to cut home for an hour and a half, come back, and uh, and then uh, make sure you guys are all out of the building when you're supposed to be. <laughs> Thank you very much. Enjoy your, enjoy your meeting. Thank you. Open, please. Open? Okay. Okay, at this time, before... Um, before I give my introductory remarks, um, we would we really want to give uh, not only there are many familiar faces here, but uh, we have two presenters here this evening who uh, who they may not be familiar with you. Our two presenters this evening are first of all from the Wisconsin Department of Revenue, John Koskinen. John, if you'd like to stand up and. And then the executive director of the Wisconsin Counties Association, Mark O'Connell. So. Well, with that, these gentlemen now would like to uh, get a flavor of who's in the audience. And, the, and I, as I said, we have a cross-representation tonight of uh, village, town, uh, county government here. So we'll start with the president of the Sauk County Unit of the Towns Association, way in back in the room. And Jim, if you want to start out, stand up uh, and tell us who your, your name and who you're representing. Jim Hipsch, uh, town. Washington Chair and also Saw County Unit Chair of the Town Association. Senator Dale Schultz, 17th Senate District. Representative Fred Clark, 42nd Assembly District and resident of the Town of Greenfield. Vernon Myers, uh, Village Board of Spring Green, Trustee. Uh, Nora Miller, Village of Spring Green, Trustee. Dennis Plifka, Town of Spring Green Chair. Paul 
State Loan Supervisor Tom Berger. Randy Clerk, our Supervisor Tom Berger. Tim Stone, Tom Berger, Chair. Alan Wildman, Village Administrator, Village Party Side. Ray Bolton, uh, trustee, Village of Burdesac. Mike Kerrigan, president of the Village of North Freedom. Tom Litcher, AD, ADRC, South County. Gene Howells, their Village of Spring Green, president. Paul Berger, out of Delona, chairman. John Schmidt, trustee for the Village of Sauk City. Jim Anderson, Sauk City Village president. Ron Lims is on the Prairie Chair. Mike Black, the Wisconsin Counties Association. John Holcomer, Wisconsin Counties Association. Brent Mahalik, uh, Conservation Fund in the Zoning Office, Sauk County. Urban Borlaski, Supervisor Tom Reedsford. Bill Staley, resident of Sauk City. Don Staley, Sauk County Supervisor, District. Here, which is Lester Weiss, president of the village of Loganville, and my last two days as on the county board. Mark Pedersen, retired. <laughs> Maureen Krieger, Reedsburg. Judy Ashford, Salt County Board Supervisor of the Merrimack area. Uh, Jason Lane, Salt County Supervisor, District 13. Dwayne Lenz, Honey Creek uh, Supervisor. Marcus Wenzel, uh, Honey Creek Chair. Bill Swartz, Tom Westfield Supervisor. Tom Broughton, Chairman of Tom Westfield. The chair is stuck. <laughs> Harold Hammer, Supervisor, Tom Westfield. Dave Baumgarten, Tom Freedom Chair. Representative Keith Rep, uh, 47th Assembly District. Uh, Tom Merrimack, Village of Merrimack, and then Logan Moore area. Don Knotts, uh, County Board Supervisor, District 21. Bruce Meyer, President, Village of West Fairwood. Greg Ashman, Trustee, Village of West Fairwood. Dave Rick, South County Supervisor, District 19 of Fairwood. Tom Jackson, I work in Senator Schultz's office, and I live a couple of hundred yards up to the north. Pete Mullen, Thomas Sumter Supervisor. Dave Lauren, Thomas Sumter Supervisor. Kathy Shaw, Administrative Coordinator for Slot County. Mark Carlson, South County Board, uh, District 24. Scott Alexander, uh, District 27. Comment to the right. Steve Bach, District 16, Fairwood. Joe Wenzel, uh, Sauk County Supervisor, District 29, which is Burger Sack. Joan Fordham, County Supervisor, District 17, in Bearable. And I'm Marty Krieger, Sauk County Board Chair. Thank you everyone for, for coming this evening. Uh, I, I guess I, is this the 12th one, Kathy? I believe so. This is the 12th intergovernmental meeting. Uh, Basically, I, I, I guess, uh, came up with this idea when I became county board chair six years ago that really what we needed was a, or what we wanted to try was a forum to try and put uh, the various units or levels of, of local government together at one table in one room uh, so that we could talk about not only common problems but uh, cooperation and common solutions that could be achieved through that cooperation. Now, when I first mentioned this, I was told that, you know, don't put all these folks together. They have different interests. But I think as, as we've gone through these 12 meetings, we have one, those of you who are maybe here for the first time tonight, um, we have one of these in the spring of every year and one in the fall. One in the fall normally occurs the around the last, October, last Thursday in October after we have crafted our budget and we roll that out and uh, I guess answer questions and, and take concerns of how that will impact you folks in this room. But I really believe that uh, as these meetings have matured and I think that uh, 
there are even folks in this room that were skeptical about the wisdom or the benefit of this to start out with that we've seen that uh, you know we we've, we've made progress uh, we have found some things that we can that we can do together we found some solutions and some benefits and every one of these has seemed to progressively gotten better and so uh, I really thank you uh, as you folks know all, the whole board is up for election uh, this next Tuesday uh, who knows if uh, I know that I'm facing opposition stiff opposition so and then uh, this is the E&L committee I'm sorry if I didn't uh, the reason the ex executive and legislative committee is in charge of the spring session so far and the finance committee has been in charge of the fall session and just as the face of the board chair may change uh, in on April 17th so may the face of this committee despite what uh, some of the letters that uh, I handpicked the E&L committee the E&L committee is elected just like the chairman is by the by the board members and so uh, these are the this is the board of the board so uh, all supervisors up for are up for election but I, I really uh, want to thank you for, for your patience and for your belief uh, these last six years in this process so that uh, welcome that is a welcome for you this evening and, and a little background for those of you who as I say might be here for the first or second time but with that um, I think that we have an exceptional program this evening and an exceptional opportunity not only for you folks to learn but really to uh, get an opportunity to uh, to ask questions and get a real understanding of first uh, what is going on at the state level as, as far as the machinations and, and revenue side of, of, of state government I heard John's presentation at the legislative exchange that was held this past February down with with the Wisconsin Counties Association um, it was the keynote and uh, I thought it was exceptional and so I asked him to come up and join us again tonight and then uh, I'm doubly pleased that uh, we have Mark O'Connell who is the WCA executive director here to bridge what you're gonna hear from John and the answers you get to really uh, you know mark works with county governments but you folks villages cities and towns all then look to county government and so uh, I think this is going to be an excellent opportunity for uh, for mark perhaps to uh, translate what you've heard from John and bring it down to the local level so with that uh, let me introduce uh, John Koskinen who serves as the Chief Economist and Division Administrator for the Division of Research and Pol Policy Analyst with the Wisconsin Department of Revenue. He leads a staff of 13 professionals specializing in economic research and tax policy analysis. The division prepares a Wisconsin economic outlook every quarter and a regional outlook for the state's metropolitan areas every year. John has testified on the Wisconsin economy before several standing committees of the state legislature. He has presented on, Wisconsin, on the Wisconsin economic outlook to the various groups around the state, including state and regional economic development associations, colleges and universities, financial institutions, and trade associations. He has been cited as a commentator on the state's economy in the press, radio, and television throughout the state. Prior to joining the Department of Revenue in 2007, John served as the staff economist for the Governor's Budget Office, Wisconsin Department of Administration, from 1979 to 2007. He started his professional career at the Wisconsin Legislative Fiscal Bureau, moved on to the Department of Commerce, then back to graduate school before settling in at DOA. John has his BA and MA in Economics from Marquette University, he has done additional graduate studies in economics at Northwestern University and computer science at the University of Wisconsin. And it's my pleasure to welcome John to Sauk County this evening. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm actually always glad to be in Sauk County. Uh, and so when I had the excuse to come up here, I grabbed it. Um, my general rule 
uh, as I go through this, is I speak totally extemporaneously so that I don't even have to put my glasses on so I can see if there are any questions. But if there are questions, I can be interrupted anytime. Uh, I go through this quickly. I try to be as uh, low key as possible. If you have questions, please, it actually helps me. That way I know whether or not I'm losing my audience. So I require audience participation. All right, today's themes. Number one, we are living in a half-fast recovery. And you'll notice how I cleaned that up in translation. <laughs> Number two, what is actually going on is we are paying the stimulus bill. Part of the reason the recovery isn't going as strong as it was is because we had a stimulus package and that stimulus package is going away. Number three, what I call the monetary policy paradox. You would love to think that low interest rates stimulate the economy, but it isn't necessarily so. Number four, I'll discuss the prospects for the U.S. and Wisconsin, I say in 2011 and 12, but that's an error on my part, it's 12 and 13. And number five, relevant to here, not only do we do a metropolitan area forecast, we are experimenting with what is called a micropolitan forecast which is those smaller communities that have their own economic uh, vitality. Baraboo is one of those micropolitan areas in Wisconsin, so we'll get to our forecast of your outlook at the very end. Believe it or not, the economy is now fully recovered. Compared to where we started at the beginning of the recession in terms of the change in real GDP, when we crossed over in fourth quarter of 2011, we at least have gotten back to where we were four years earlier. Took a while. And it is surprising to say that at this point, the recovery is starting to get long in the tooth. We are already in its 34th month, which puts it, if you think in terms of all the recessions, the recoveries from recessions, since 1953, we're flirting with already like the fifth longest recovery. Shows you how deep we actually went. What has happened though is real GDP relative to more recent recoveries has stalled. In terms of the cumulative growth as we were first coming out of the recovery, the pace was actually faster than the 91 recession or the 2001 recession. In the last few quarters, last four quarters, that gain has disappeared and we are now lagging behind even the pace of more modern recoveries. In fact, when I said it was a half-fast recovery, I wasn't kidding. The growth is indeed half as fast as you would normally get for the first nine quarters of a recovery. All right, uh, for those of you who suffered through macroeconomics and remembered anything, um, or were not paying attention, for those who didn't, really, how they measure the economy is they, they sit down and figure out how much do people spend on these things? How much do they spend on consumption? That's the C. How much do they spend on investment? What are we getting out of our trade sector, exports and imports? And then how much is government spending? That's what determines what real GDP is. We've already had many sectors of the economy fully recovered. Consumption actually recovered, not necessarily early, but four quarters before the rest of the economy. If you compare the real GDP, which is the red line, to the consumption, which is the green line. And indeed, retail sales have been running, not stellar, but a, a really decent 6.5% on a year. And it's been in that 6.5%, 7% territory since roughly the last two years. It's sort of shocking, though, if you look at the bottom. When you realize we, the bottom had fallen out, we were looking at retail sales falling at 14 and 15% a year. Yes, it's going to take you two years to 6.5% to get back to where you were. Exports, on the other hand, did really, really well. Exports didn't drive nearly as much as the U.S. economy in total. And in fact, they had recovered within about four quarters of uh, after they first went down, they recovered within six quarters. And for Wisconsin, we see the same pattern. Wisconsin exports actually set a record in 2011. The only thing that concerns me right now is we're sort of flat since July. But the total for exports in 2011 is a new record for the state. Now, if all those other things are going great, what happened on the government side? Well, here's a shock to everybody. Federal spending never declined. 
But we are now coming to the limits of what I call macro policy. Number one is fiscal policy. What had happened in fiscal, the bill is now coming due for the 2009 stimulus. And number two, we are living what's called a liquidity trap. You can lower interest rates, but it doesn't mean people are going to borrow money. What has actually happened is all of that stimulus money, and you can see from roughly, you see this giant leap in what is federal aid to state and local governments. Lo and behold, that is going away. And as that goes away, we also have another problem. In part, that decision to go ahead and give the state and local governments a lot of money was founded by, well, look what happened to state and local government tax collections as the recession hit. It lost a good $200 billion nationwide. And in fact, for the state of Wisconsin, we will not recover to where we were in the peak of tax collections, of which was fiscal 08, until fiscal 13. It's going to take us five years. There's a subtle thing in this graph, of course, that while we allegedly recovered in 2012, that was on the back of 400 and some odd million dollars worth of tax increases each year through combined reporting, the increase in the top rate, and the reduction of capital gains exclusion. If setting aside those tax increases, we were, were not going to be back to our fiscal 08 level until next fiscal year. As a consequence of declining tax revenues and withdrawn federal money, state and local governments, of course, do not have the luxury that the federal government has. They actually have to pay their bills with real money. As a consequence, when that money is withdrawn, spending follows. And right now, state and local government spending has retreated to a levels of 11 years ago. Nationally, we are not alone. Nationally, state government employment has been declining on a year-over-year year, year year basis for about three years now. And that is a distinguishing characteristic of this recovery versus the two prior recoveries. You're having state and local government workforces shrink even as the recovery proceeds. And most states are reducing their workforces. State government employment changed over the last four years since the beginning of the recession from December 07 to December 2011. If you're in red, your state government workforce has been reduced by more than 5%. If you're in yellow, it's somewhere between 0 and 5. And you'll see that covers most of the state. Only if you're in green or blue are you seeing expanding employment at the state level. By the way, I think Wisconsin's number four for the largest state government employment loss. Indeed, this is uh, state of Wisconsin employment. Uh, we are now at levels of 19 years ago. And at this stage, uh, we're plotting, uh, this plots the cumulative change in Wisconsin employment since the start of the recession. Needless to say, construction manufacturing usually are your biggest hits. Construction lost 14% of its employment, but it's now recovered to the point where it's only down 10%. But at this stage, State government losses rival the manufacturing losses. Yes? At what level are those losses in state workers? At the bottom level, at the top level, you know? Um, I think it's twofold. Um, one of which is there are obvious position reduction. It, I don't think it matters. Where I think you're seeing a big change, and I'll, I'll use my department to illustrate. Um, Ten years ago, the Department of Revenue had 1,100 employees. <coughs> Now we have 880 full-time employees. Those same 10 years ago, we had 700 LDEs to open mail at this time of the season. It's peak processing season. Now we have 100 in the mail room. Because, and if you think of it, that displacement of those LDEs that helped us during tax processing season, those folks that would open up the envelopes, sort them out, we used to have two weeks worth of backlogs worth of paper. We don't see that paper anymore. It's all electronic. As a consequence, if you consider the aggregate I would describe, the Department of Revenue is operating with more taxpayers, more claims, and are dealing with a workforce that's about 35% less than 10 years ago. And relative to your claim, when we have to go through budget reductions, if a position is vacant, does it matter where it is? Not much. In my section, um, 
I can't hire a clerical, I can't hire an economist, and I can't hire a supervisor of the economist. So, uh, so it, it's almost immaterial. I think it makes a lot of difference in dollar amounts if, you're, if, if it's the bottom of their own people that are leaving or, or, or that are I, I being, you know, get not, not rehired or whatever. Or if, it's, or if it's the people that are making I, I, totally, I totally agree, and I think what is happening generally is information technology is displacing um, a lot of what you would use to think in terms of back, off, back office operations for all of state government. I think the other thing that happens um, in terms of a lot of the employment is it's voluntary separations. I think that big drop that you see right there, right around June and July, a lot of people decided to retire. And then right again here, we have January. A lot of people decided to retire. So right now you're seeing a lot of people that have decided that I will retire and it's going to be a long time back before you have the, we're still sort of in a retire no hire mode. Eventually we'll get to the, it's okay to hire mode again, but we're not there now. All right, all of that discussion was to highlight one of the principal areas of weakness in the economy is state and local governments. They have been shrinking and that's unprecedented. Now the second part comes, it's not just state and local government, it is investment in housing and corporate structures. That is actually the principal weakness in the economy is the lack of investment. Short-term interest rates in particular, you like to think in terms of when the federal government announces, the Federal Reserve announces, we're going to hold interest rates low until 2015. That doesn't necessarily spur more investments. It hasn't moved long-term rates all that much, and the relationship between interest and investment that we like to think about has changed. There's point blank, nobody wants to borrow money with one critical exception. I'll get to that. This is a change in total investment in the U.S. economy since the recession. We have not recovered to pre-recession levels yet, and we're still over $300 billion short, principally in structures in industry, the blue line, or housing, the black line. Right now, the federal funds rate has been less than one-tenth of one percent since April 2011, and that doesn't seem to be moving the demand for funds. If you think in terms of what are government bonds at, index for inflation, they've actually been negative since the middle of last year. The problem is that if we cut short-term interest rates, which we did back in 2009, it doesn't necessarily follow that what private business can borrow at changes all that much. The BAA corporate rate has been flirting with 5% consistently despite the fact that you know there used to be only like you know one percentage point difference. Now it's five. It doesn't seem to matter because that's a long-term rate. People treat it differently. And of course, Excuse me. yeah. Uh, can you go back one slide? Mm -hmm. Who's who's in there? Who's in where? Why is why is there disparity there? I mean, the economy functioned okay uh, in uh, when it was one percent spread, and uh, and now it's five. It's five because partly it's the difference between a short-term rate and, and what the Fed will give you overnight. That's what the Federal Reserve rate is. The BAA corporate is a corporation saying we're going to pay you back over 20 years. You have one of slightly different element in risk and the two, second of which is I don't think the bond market believes that interest rates can be sustained at that lower level, which they can't be. So they're going to price it like we're expecting it to be. And you just have to think about it. Um, Really, long-term interest rates should be roughly what the inflation rate is and what real growth is. If the inflation rate is 2% and growth is 3, the interest rate should be about 5%. Right now, the inflation rate is flirting with 3 and real growth is 2, but it still should be about 5%. So long-term rates should be roughly inflation plus real growth, and that's where it's at. I haven't, I was actually, don't get me started. I go on these tangents, and I was going to go off on a tangent, and now Mark's got to talk. I can't keep talking. <laughs> All right. Mortgage interest rates. Mortgage interest rates have actually been at record lows. If you recall, for those of us who were trying to buy a house in 1981, because I certainly remember, when mortgage interest rates were 
that completely shut down the real estate market and the housing construction. But lo and behold, let's see if I get this next. Yeah, there you go. When those interest rates fell from 16% to a mere 10, it spurred housing development. Now we're in a situation, the red line, by the way, is the mortgage rate. The blue line is the housing starts. We've had mortgage interest rates at four or less for at least six months. Do we see any movement in housing starts or home sales? No. The relationship that used to be there to spur the economy between a cut in mortgage rates and will stimulate housing construction has shut down. But isn't that because a lot of people don't know if they have a job tomorrow or they're out of work for a long time? I, yes, and I'll give you three more reasons. <laughs> um, absolutely, I think if there's uncertainty about whether or not you have employment prospects, do I have a long-term prospect or am I going to be unemployed again in three years? Do I want to make a 30-year commitment? Probably not. The second one that I think in terms of, and I, I almost sat down to do the math and illustrate it, but I figured, okay, if I'm struggling with it, I'm not going to be able to explain it if I can't explain it with everybody anyway. But stop and think about it. If you bought a $200,000 house, 20% down, you put down $40,000. If you go up, if that house goes up 5%, your $40,000 equity is now $50,000. Your return on equity was actually 20% because it's a leveraged investment. This is great, 25% actually. This is great. Now imagine it going the other way. And if it goes out of the other way for three and four years, you're seeing your money destroyed. Who wants to enter the housing market when you aren't sure the house that you buy is going to be worth what you paid for next year or the year after if you have to sell it because you need to move a job? It freezes everybody. And frankly, I think yeah, at that point, you start thinking, maybe renting isn't such a bad idea. Where we are getting lifts on the housing construction side is on the rental side. And you're seeing houses that are bought to be turned into rentals. Because the person buying it can actually take the risk. In terms of the slide, housing stuck in the wall, the Bureau of Economic Analysis does this lovely series called Investment in Residential Housing, Billions of $2,005. And they go back to 1960. We are at the lowest level in those 50 some odd years. And we really haven't moved out of it. In part, it is well, following that blue line. The blue line is the Federal Housing Finance, uh, Federal Finance Housing Authority Index of what housing prices are nationwide. You had a big explosion in prices and you've had a big correction of the housing bubble since then. And that's the part that we were just describing. When you're having prices go down consistently, that will undercut what people want to do for housing. We in Wisconsin have retreated to levels of about 2003 at this point. So at that point, think about it, the housing prices that prevailed nine years ago are what you're seeing now. Ours is not the most severe. We are about a little better than the US average, actually, in terms of the housing correction. Um, if you're blue, you actually had an appreciation of house over the last five years. If you're white, it's been zero to 10% decline. And if you're in the gray, it's 15 to 10%. Wisconsin's 12, by the way. Um, but if you're in yellow, you're looking to like a 15 to 20% decline over five years. If you're in red, it's 20 to 25% decline. If you're in the deep red, you're looking at a 25% decline. Nevada, prices have declined more than 50% they are at this point back to price levels of 1992. What's the yellow? The yellow is a 20 to 25% price decline. So you can see, actually, we sort of compare ourselves to the neighbors with the exception of Iowa. Minnesota and Illinois are undergoing a much more severe price correction than we are. Now, I said housing was bouncing along low. Wisconsin's housing starts have been since October 2009 or a little even earlier. We've been bouncing around the 11,000 level. That's about a third of what is normal. That all reflects in the property values. While I said Wisconsin had its value decline, you can see it's not necessarily consistent. Certain counties, in particular, if you look, the ring counties around what would be Minneapolis, St. Paul, 
are the ones that are seeing the biggest price pressures. Or if you have the Kenosha's case, some spillover from the Chicago market, Rock County's case, they lost an auto plant. Milwaukee, also dealing with sort of industrial, well, they had a lot of other issues there. But most of the state did not see that price decline that we saw. It is concentrated in certain markets. And including, that's also true for Sauk County. These are the price declines for each municipality within Sauk County. You see some areas, that if you're in the green, you actually had an increase in residential values. If you're red, you had a, a correction that exceeded 3%. Why isn't, the other thing that's going on with not only that housing that people doesn't want to go in, the other thing is on the consumer side of it, consumers uh, have stopped borrowing money. They've really been paying down debt. Um, we get the macro forecast from Global Insight and they have this macro key that says consumers are overextended and I thought, I keep meaning to write into them and say, are you looking at the same stuff I'm looking at? We've been paying down debt as a consumer household for over three years, closing on a four. And in fact, uh, we rapidly, we only recently have gotten to the stage where credit card use increased over the prior year. From 2008 until late last year, consumer credit debt was declining. As a consequence of both, you know, mortgages have this lovely property that if you keep paying on them, your debt goes down. Uh, it's true on credit cards too. And as you refinance into these lower rate instruments, the amount that you have to pay out to pay your bills, your auto lease, your mortgage, your property taxes, your insurance, is all built into a series the Federal Reserve does called the Financial Obligations Ratio. That's the FOB ratio what I put up there. Um, the 30-year average is the green line. We're actually below where we were 30 years ago. We're flirting, if this keeps up, with all-time lows. Consumers have been so good at paying down debt and reining in spending, that's another thing that holds back the economy. But that also suggests why the low interest rates aren't going to stimulate anything, because if you're not borrowing the money, with the exception of cars these days, you're not going to really uh, be popping up the rest of the economy. There is, of course, one group that decides it needs to borrow a lot of money. And as you can see, the black line is what has happened in the change in borrowing of, at the federal level. Whereas consumers, the blue line, have been actually paying down debt. Corporations during the middle of the recession went to paying on debt, and they're actually below where they were before the recession hit in terms of borrowing now. There is one group that's basically tripled or quadrupled its borrowing, and that is the federal government. In some respects, federal borrowing has taken over where consumer and business borrowing used to be. There is an unfortunate side effect of the low interest policy. For anybody that has a certificate deposit that is about to roll over, good luck. Uh, the amount of income that people get from uh, interest has actually been cut from nearly 1500 to about uh, 1500 billion dollars to about 1 trillion dollars. That's a big reduction spending that could have been propped up if interest rates had stayed the same, now that's wiped out of purchasing power because the interest income isn't there. And anybody trying to plan for a 401k or all those other things realizes that too. This slide argues that the slide into two sectors, just the residential housing and the state and local government, is sufficient to explain why the recovery is half-paced. You actually have Unlike all the other recession recoveries, those two sectors are still in decline. If we were to keep them even flat, that much less prior levels, in fact, the recovery would be about the same pace as the two prior recessions. All right, uh, Wisconsin outlook. Uh, Wisconsin unemployment right now is running below average, uh, rather significantly so. We're at 6.9 versus a U.S. rate of about 8.3. Um, we are one of the 25 states whose unemployment rate is significantly below the U.S. average. If you're blue, your unemployment rate is below 6. If you're green, like Wisconsin, your unemployment rate is below 
If you're white at 7.6 to 9, that's roughly comparable to the U.S. average. If you're yellow or red, you're significantly above the U.S. average. Um, the part that's because our manufacturing side is actually what's carrying our recovery. Milwaukee's manufacturing index is actually running well ahead of the U.S. And in terms of our total employment growth, you can see the red line, manufacturing covered, and is running well ahead of total employment growth. Just released yesterday uh, was our per capita personal income. Uh, Wisconsin's per capita personal income growth actually placed us in the top quarter of the states. We ranked 11th overall. Uh, so we were outpacing the national growth and income recovery. And we're also 20, we are 25th now in per capita personal income for 2010 and 2011. Um, and really, we didn't have the income decline that the rest of the country did. As bad as it was for us, it was worse elsewhere. We are actually edging closer to the U.S. average in terms of per capita personal income. What we have is actually right now an economy in transition. Part of what is affecting, adversely affecting our job numbers is the losses at the government side. In terms of year over year, December, December 2010 to 2009, 2009 to 2010, and 2011 to 2010, while we didn't have strong total growth in 2011, our private employment growth was equally as strong as the prior year. It's our losses were on the government side. So in a sense, as the government frees up resources in the private sector, we are in the moment in transition. We are looking forward to stronger growth prospects, however. Just released last week, uh, the Federal Reserve Bank of Philadelphia has a forward-looking index suggesting what kind of growth are you expecting in the next six months. If you're green, you're expecting growth over 1.5%. Only if you're blue, are you expecting more than 4.5%. Wisconsin's expecting stronger growth, actually, than our neighbors to the west, Iowa and Minnesota. And actually, I think if I think I, yes, I do have it. Uh, next slide. We've had a sharp turnaround in our leading index over the last couple of weeks, the last couple of months. And at its current level, we are back to levels that we last saw nine years ago. We are expecting for us that Wisconsin will match the U.S. rate of employment by 2013. Right now, what is holding our growth rate down for 12 is, again, government job losses. Uh, the, while that total is about one half percent, if we were looking at just the private side, we'd be at one one, which is comparable to what the U.S. average is. Our income outlook, we had a very good year in 2011. That's actually going to be updated. Um, and 12, we're looking at something a little off because of the employment changes, but we'll be matching the U.S. outlook by 2013. Now we get into your stuff. Um, there are these nice little green dots are one of the peculiar strengths of Wisconsin economy that is significantly different than most other states is we don't have employment necessarily totally concentrated in metropolitan areas. If you were to look at the Minnesota economy and you stepped outside of the Twin Cities, forget it. All their economy is in that metropolitan area. Their micropolitan areas are few and far between. For Wisconsin, that actually stabilizes our economy. Baraboo, or his micropolitan area, is the Sauk County area. By population, uh, they range from about 100,000 to about 25,000. Baraboo puts us right at about 63, 66. Somebody's going to correct me if I'm wrong on that one real fast. In terms of population change, though, consider that the Baraboo or Sauk County area is actually growing faster than the nation in terms of total population and is growing faster than Wisconsin as a whole. And in terms of employment growth for 10 and 11, for our cross estimates for 11, uh, Baraboo, while we lost employment in 2010, it regained it in 2011. Um, personal income growth in 2009, everybody was taking a hit. Baraboo took a hit, but not nearly as severe as the state as a whole. And in terms of per capita personal income, Baraboo looks very much like the state as a whole. 
all, you know, if you plot it out, and I did that, I was about to do that, but I saw we had this one. It's about 97 to 99.5% of Wisconsin average. So in many respects, you can almost look at how the state itself is doing in terms of income variable will follow. And right now, Wisconsin's unemployment rate is usually near the Wisconsin average, but usually a little below. The red line is Wisconsin, the light blue is Baraboo or Sac County. Uh, and it depends seasonally. There seemed to be a seasonal pattern this time around. You have a little higher unemployment in January than usually had. Usually you were always consistently below, but this recession, as if tourism must have been affected even during the winter months. Uh, so you're having higher unemployment now in uh, January than you ordinarily would. You can attribute that to the lack of snow because the snowmobilers couldn't come through. You know, I, I, I used to drive the interstate and sort of count the number of Chevy Suburbans with the four <laughs> slabs on the back on the interstate that had Illinois plates on them and realized I wasn't seeing any. <laughs> so yes, I would attribute it to that. I would also attribute it to um, the leisure and hospitality industry in the state and nationwide did suffer because where people would tend to go for four days or five days, make it a really long weekend, they would be up for the weekend only. And instead of eating out of the room, going to the restaurants, they buy food and eat in the room. I, I think that hurt a lot in, in you know you have good ski areas around here, and I think well, the lack of snow. You know, people don't think about skiing if there isn't snow on the ground out of their backyard, even if there's ski on the hills. So, all right. In terms of employment prospects, uh, employment percent change over the year. We had a good rebound for you in 2000. Actually, that's the income. I have it flipped. This is actually I have the slides labeled wrong. So trust me. This is actually your employment outlook. That where you had declines in 9 and 10, you had a rebound in 11, we're expecting good solid growth that's actually going to exceed the national average uh, through 2014. And back here is actually income growth. Uh, you had a good rebound in income because employment came back in 2011. We're expecting roughly 3, 8, and 12, and 13. And that, that's it. Questions? Ah, that's a good question. That, that fits in two ways, actually. Everybody didn't hear the question. Uh, the question is, thank you. The question is, how does the stock market fit into all this? Um, I actually wish I brought the slides and I, I could get into my computer. I could probably do that. It fits in two ways. Um, one of which is um, everybody if, is a target saver. If, in fact, you're thinking in terms of, I have to fund retirement, I have to fund college, if I'm getting 20% returns on stocks, how much do I have to put in to hit my savings goal? Not that much. This is taking it over. It's, this is great. And so either I can take some money out and spend it, or I don't have to put as much out to spend it. Now when stocks go the other way, and you're seeing these big losses, and now you're looking at the prospect of retiring, do you you almost have to double down or triple down in order to meet your savings goal. So there's a feedback loop. If stocks are great, you don't have to save as much, and you can see the savings rate really decline as a result. On the other hand, if stocks are going down, we have to redouble our efforts, and people start in savings uh, even more. So I think that's where you get the big feedback loop. It does, it, in terms of when we have to do our sales tax estimates, we actually have uh, one of the explanatory variables, one of the things that we help figure out how much people are going to consume because there is a wealth effect uh, from SACS. And I think it comes through that loop, like I just said, because we're target savers. Yes, Senator Schultz. Uh, where does Wisconsin rank? I'm sorry, I, I, I pointed the gentleman way in the back. Uh, I'm sorry. Could, what could you tell us about uh, corporate sales, income, and excise tax collections over the last year and where you're projecting them to go into the future? Um, We do backdoor discussions with the Fiscal Bureau, and we have our own estimates that we share with them. And we, we're not obligated to publish until November. Um, I would say that ours were coincident with the Fiscal Bureau's. Um, I'm roughly thinking longer term, you're not getting sort of the big income growth. One of the setups for us 
is we have a lot of tax cuts that were deferred during the 2009 budget because as a way to, that would have been implemented, that were delayed, that we're still gonna have to continue to pay for. We have the qualified activities production credit that's coming on stream. Normally we'd be looking at roughly 5% growth in individual income taxes, but we're going to be looking longer term at more like four until all of those are phased in. Sales tax collections are going to be running at about 3.5%. Corporate, because of its volatility, uh, we're, we are a little more optimistic on that one because corporate profitability is so good, but once it's rebounded at a certain level, you don't get much more growth in it. Really, the two drivers for the general fund are, are just income and sales. On the excise tax, uh, I think most people would be surprised to know that we collect more in cigarette taxes than we do from public utilities now. It's, it's the fourth largest tax in the general fund. But cigarettes, of course, part of the reason you want, lovely dilemma, you want more money and you want people to quit smoking, so we'll tax cigarettes and, and once you do that, people quit smoking, which means the tax goes down. Well, that, that, that's what you want it to do, but if you want to rely on it as a source of revenue, right. don't plan on it. It's, it's not gonna work. All right, yes? Okay, well, where does Wisconsin rank in the total amount of taxes that the individual would pay in, as far as the rest of the nation? Um, I could probably parse that several different ways. I, I will say that um, we have dropped out of the top 10 on uh, total tax burden. And if you, it becomes sensitive to which income class you're in. If you're actually in the bottom 20%, we actually rank very low. We tend to be higher sort of in the middle side uh, than the lower side and a little higher in the middle side than on the upper side. So, um, but overall, I would say that we're, used, we're flirting with 10th, 9th, 10th, or 11th on total taxes uh, as percentage of personal income. And sometimes it depends on what our personal income number is, which was good, so I expect it to drop. I expect it to drop out of the Is that including time. real estate? Mm -hmm. It would include everything. And, it, and, and when, you, when you see those rankings, not only includes that, it also includes your driver's license, your automobile registration, your snowmobile registration, and I have yet to figure out why the Census Bureau thinks a hunting and fishing license is a tax, but they do. For those of us who like to hunt fish, I don't consider it a tax, but I, I think they treat it as a privilege tax. Anything else? Okay. Oh, sorry, go ahead. If interest rates stay low and it's not helping the housing industry, why don't you get raise the interest rates so us old folks can live off our CDs? Um, <laughs> I could not agree with you more. I actually, and the other day we had this group uh, among state agencies called the Economic Roundtable, the chief economist for the Labor Department, Dennis Winter. He and I have always been wondering why they haven't raised it with the interest rates. Because it's not like it's doing anything, right? Um, so. The only reason to keep it low at that point is there's got to be some connection to the financial side that is not exactly obvious to me. And maybe it's because the banks can make money by having overnight money at one tenth percent or less, and they can buy, you know, three-year treasury bills, and they don't even have to lend. They can almost just play an arbitrage game just on that basis. And I'm not sure of the wisdom. They're, and they're, if you follow the business press very carefully. There are strong dissenters now in the Federal Reserve Board of Governors, some of which think it is time for us to start thinking about raising interest rates again. Yes? Well, the two trends that you mentioned, the, the deleveraging of consumers and the, the lack of housing starts, even though interest rates are good. Right. Would you attribute any of that to the federal bank regulatory policy? Oh, great question. <laughs> Absolutely. No, abs absolutely. Uh, I, I actually had a chance to do this a similar presentation in front of CPAs, and I, if I had known you were going to ask it, I have five slides that would prove it for you. Um, the the lending standard differences. It's as if 
you have two branches of the federal government that involved in the banking and financial sector. You have the Federal Reserve, which is cutting these interest rates, and you have the FDIC, which basically is so worried about bank failures, say, don't you dare lend to anybody until you are straightened out. And, and that culture is only beginning to thaw out. You've seen the discussions now on stress tests, maybe you have, maybe you haven't, but that's part of what's going on, is can banks actually go out and lend now? FDIC, before that, was wanting everybody to get the tier one capital ratios. And in a sense, you know, when you stop and think about that, back in the days, five years ago, subprime lending, you had a 600 credit score, it doesn't matter. Get 550, doesn't matter, we'll give you a 30 year mortgage. Now, 760, we're going to have to think about this. And, and that alone is going to put a huge crimp in it. All right, anything else? Okay.